opportunities to properly compete in an SCCA sanctioned race meet at the challenging Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca in Northern California don't come around all that often, especially if you happen to be an Australian motoring journalist. It's pure bucket list stuff. But the chance to go back in an attempt to slash a few tenths off my lap time on a corner by corner basis, well, that's pretty much impossible. Unless, of course, you're prepared to put your hand deep in your pockets and hire a full-blown cup racer. Now, Tim Barber at TFB Performance agreed to rent me the Winding Road team car that had blown by me on more than one occasion during race weekend, as well as notching up two MX-5 Cup wins during the official season. This is one of the fastest MX-5 Cup cars in the series right now. It's a beautiful setup, a really sweet tune. Big race cage, race seat, telemetry dash, and special Mazda racing steering wheel. We've got these super lightweight wheels with Brembo's and drill discs. We've got to go below 92 decibels. Now the normal exhaust system on the MX-5 Cup car runs at about 98. So we've got a quiet exhaust system at the back here. This is not normally here. Looks a bit kind of cumbersome, but that gets us under the 92 dB, which is important. Uh, because this is kind of a residential area where Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca is. TFB Performance arrived complete with a huge motorhome and trailer driven by Chris, my crew chief for this weekend. These guys are as important as your coach. They're the ultimate problem solvers and vital to your confidence. Thanks in advance, Chris. All this doesn't come cheap. Ten grand. And that's if you don't break it. Bend it or burn it, and you're likely to be up for a brand new 55,000 buck US MX-5 Cup car. There's also the issue of getting on the actual circuit, no mean feat, even if such an opportunity is sanctioned by Mazda US itself, something that only happens twice a year, and only for family and friends. Of course, if you want to improve in any sport, you need a coach. And for me, there was only one choice in the US, 2015 Daytona winner and all-round nice guy, Kenton Cook. Kenton walked us through the MX-5 Global Cup Invitational late last year, and I figured if he couldn't help me shave a tenth or two off my best race time, then I was probably beyond all redemption. Thankfully, the Saturday skies were clear as we arrived at the track at 8 a.m. for a scheduled 9 a.m. start, and like any amateur, I was praying for clear skies and a dry track. Laguna Seca in the wet just isn't fun, and something I hadn't factored in. It's a low grip surface, so even a minor mistake can see the car get pear-shaped pretty quickly. The MX-5 was already unloaded and waiting for my seat fitting. It's so important to feel comfortable behind the wheel before you head out onto the track. It might not seem like much, but my goal was to clock a 148-149 down from the 150 I'd managed on race day. Easier said than done at this most daunting of race circuits. But with 70 odd laps under my belt, I was quite confident that I knew the track well enough to press a little harder. Even Kenton that, like, and Chris, were doing this, the like, crew yeah, chief says this no is a handful. All MX-5 Cup cars require great driving skills. So if you can't drive, you're not going to be fast. After a couple of extra seat inserts, I was good to go. Thankfully, I wouldn't be up against any of the crack drivers from the MX-5 Cup Invitational. I'm only competing against myself and my pathological fear of the two balls out turns that had me jinxed. Turn six into Raal straight and turn nine rainy curve. There was a ton of things I needed to work on, but mostly it was all about the basics. The stuff we've learned a hundred times, but easily forgotten when the pressure's on. Getting your eyes up. So much harder than it sounds, but crucial if you're to nail a string of turns with the maximum entry and exit speeds. Quicker transition from throttle to brake. I have a tendency to come off the throttle before hitting the brakes, and that can cost you a second or two, especially in turn two, where decent rolling speed is critical. Corner speed. I was too focused on how early I could get back on the power rather than how much speed I could roll through the corner. And then there were the track specific issues, corner by corner. While the car felt familiar, Kenton's advice was just take it easy and get familiar with the car. 
While it wasn't a race, there were plenty of high-performance exotics on the circuit, ready and willing to show the MX-5 a thing or two. My strategy was to take a corner-by-corner -corner approach, commencing with turn two and its double apex, at least for this session. More if I could remember, though. But right from the get-go, this car felt more tied down and better balanced than the cars I'd raced here previously. It felt beautifully tied down and begging to be pushed harder than I'd ever gone before in race conditions. Belting up the main straightaway from second at turn 11 and on to fifth with a throttle pin, your sense of self-preservation is telling you to hit the anchors long before you need to, especially in the lightweight MX-5. But you resist telling yourself, don't brake, don't brake, wait, wait, now drill it, quick, off the pedal and turn in and roll and wait, wait, okay, back on the throttle and let the car run out. Well, that went well, I thought. I've just rounded up a 911 and a few others. Turn three was better too, but damn it, I was still holding too much brake and for too long with not enough rolling speed through the bends. It slows you down on the run up to turn four where I'd been hit on lap 20 last time I was here. Turn five was by now a favorite. I was braking way later and rolling through more speed and loving it. But still too slow getting back on the power. It's really frustrating, but not nearly as challenging as turn six. Turns out I'm good up until I tap the brakes at full throttle in fourth as I approach the crest. Then I panic and dab the brake again on turn in with near catastrophic results. The car spins only 180 degrees, thankfully, but I managed to keep it firmly on the black stuff. Really annoyed with myself, as this was going really well up to that point. I felt better knowing I wasn't the only one, though, facing the wrong way at some point during the day. The corkscrew approach is way more difficult than the corkscrew itself, because the left-hand entry is blind, and then it's a quick right and flat down the drop before shifting into fourth and lining up the tricky off camber turn nine. Not back on the power early enough. Getting it wrong here almost certainly sets you up for failure with turn 10, though I've definitely got more speed through this turn as I hammer down to turn 11 and onto the main straightaway. Even though Kenton says this is my best turn, I'm still keen to get on the throttle more aggressively for a faster exit onto that straightaway. The beauty of a properly set up car is the telemetry. So Kenton and I headed back to the trailer to see what I was doing right and where I needed to improve. So going over from the last session, the things that we you know, wanted to improve on was rolling speed, getting into the corners. Yeah. Turn two, I was coming off the throttle too early and onto the brakes. At least a second or two was to be found there. Just making sure we commit to power and get our eyes up through the corner and open up our hands to, yeah. to see that track. I feel like I've, my eyes are still not up yeah. for the next corner. Like I'm, mm -hmm. It's not something I'm thinking about consciously. Honestly, the, the pros even have a hard time getting their eyes up. In turn three, I needed to apply lighter initial brake pressure after the second brake marker and then getting back on the power just after the apex. The places that we really improved were getting into turn four and five. Uh, really the, where we were working on to try to get a little bit more rolling speed and this was like the, the one session that we saw like the biggest improvement in this session specifically over the, the previous sessions like in turn four we improved five miles an hour at the apex as well as in turn five. Turn six my greatest fear and challenge according to the data I've got good initial brake pressure but I'm holding on to it for fear of losing it and spinning the car. Spin. Yeah, but getting into turn six this, this time that we actually had a, an issue this time, uh, the little things we were talking about were making sure we're not braking on the way to the apex. Uh, and this time you broke a little bit too hard uh, and you caused a spin. Uh, and that's what you know, putting nose, uh, weight on the nose does. does. Um, it, it can cause the car to get into a spin when in reality you're actually still going slow. It just you know, unsettles the car a bit. So that's yeah. why you want to... You know, come off the brake pedal before we turn in to make sure we settle that car, put a little bit more weight on the rear, and that uh, will give us a little bit more security in the rear. So probably if I'd have not hit the brake pedal at all, you would have been fine. Even just rolling yeah, speed, you would carry have rolling speed. Yeah, yeah, you turned in at the right time. You actually, your initial brake pressure was beautiful, and you were looking good for the apex, but you just, you know, you get your eyes up through the road um, and you know, attack the brake pedal when you shouldn't have. And that's how 
That's how scary. That's Sensitive. how scary that turn six is. Definitely I thought I had. I, I thought I had some balls, but clearly <laughs> not. Clearly <laughs> not. Thank you. To be honest, even if you end up losing it here, it's not really a big deal, as there's a whole lot of sand to slow you down before the barrier. Approaching the corkscrew 8A and B, I still needed to brake later and harder, just two car lengths before the white kerb on the right. The big three-storey drop onto the corkscrew itself isn't really challenging, but you need to be flat on the way down, as this has the effect of pushing the car into the turn so the car feels properly planted. Turn nine is another balls out corner, which is taken in fourth, but it pushes the car wide, so I'm lifting too early, which is reducing roll and entry speed, as well as not getting back on the power early enough. And then in turn 10, on your best lap, you actually kind of got messed up, and you would have been about a half second to six tenths quicker on, on, your, on this lap, um, mm -hmm. you know, which would have seemed like a 49.5, which would have been the best one of the weekend. Uh, you know, it's just the things that we, we still need to work on. A, uh, just working on building up a little bit more confidence on um, some of the corners, uh, specifically turn six, just you know, yes. making sure we stabilize the car and not uh, uh, brake twice, because braking towards the apex after we turn is something that's going to upset it the car. Just a spin like what happened. Yeah, exactly. There were no issues with turn 11, my strongest corner, but to be honest, I always felt too timid on the exit and wholeheartedly believed I could get back on the power earlier for the run down the straightaway. I'm barely off the track 10 minutes and the rain starts falling heavily. You're going to go out in the rain and just feel, see what the tyres are like, the wets? Yep, which yeah, is good. I've never, uh, never driven this track in the wet on these tyres and with this car. So it'll, um, hopefully it's wet for the next session for you to go out there so we can you know, learn a little bit as well. I'm uh, hoping it's not. <laughs> I'm definitely hoping it's not wet. I'm hoping it's wet, yeah. That'd be fun. Kenton is keen for me to get amongst it in the wet and assures me the control wets for the Cup Series provide outstanding grip, but not for me, not today. My dry track confidence is on the rise and a wet weather incident might shatter this newfound self-assurance. And frankly, I'm keen to see what Kenton can do in these conditions. Sure enough, it was a spectacle worth watching as he sliced through it with extraordinary ease. Spectators were simply in awe, so are we. His car control through the slippery corkscrew is truly a thing of marvel. There is sighs of relief from fellow onlookers as he comes oh, down the drop sideways. Oh no. Wow! Whoa, that guy came in sideways. Only to blow past a GT3 in full flight as if it was standing still. This is what a Daytona winner can do in an MX5 Cup car. It's just extraordinary. No sooner had the rain started to fall, the sun was back out over a dry track, and I'm itching to get back out and nail down a few more corners. Once you know the circuit, it's very much a confidence game, but getting your eyes into each and every corner is a constant battle, and it's so easy to forget this most crucial practice. It's the one thing that requires utter consistency if you're going to improve lap times. The good news is I'd recorded a 149.03 as per Kenton's timing, but I still felt I could take at least another two seconds off that result. It was just a question of stringing all 11 corners together on one lap, which I simply wasn't able to get done this weekend. That said, the telemetry indicated that all corners got better. I had better rolling speed to the apex and committed to power still a tad late, but all at once meaning throttle to brake, brake to throttle transition was 95% there. Minimum speeds were generally three to five miles per hour higher in turns four, five, six, and 10. In fact, my minimum speed was identical to Kenton's in turn two and was easily my best corner. Turn four is still tricky, given you have to have a very high minimum speed through the apex, but I reckon I nearly nailed it. I simply didn't brake at all and lifted later which helped carry a higher minimum speed. Even turn six was a mild improvement despite the spin. Would I come back? You bet, especially with this car and this setup. I'm pleased to have dipped under the 150 sec time, but still believing a 148, 147 is very much within my reach, given the simple fundamentals that need to be more consistent. Was it worth the 10K for a slight improvement on my lap times? You bet, but I got a lot more out of it than that. 
It's about learning and mastering a few fundamental rules of racing, which can be applied to any road or track. And when you get it right, it's sheer joy. What a weekend. After 70 laps here at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca, I've had some massive improvement. In fact, on turn two, the quickest entry corner, I've got to within four tenths of my coach, Kenton Cook. And the crew chief has been fantastic, Chris. The car has been wonderfully tuned. And there's 10 other corners that I've got to perfect. So guess what? There's no question I'm coming back. 